Hello and welcome back to English 332, Writing in the Professions. This lecture will be covering Chapter 5, which is Planning, Composing, and Revising. And we have uh, three learning objectives for today. We'll be talking about the composing process, guidelines for words, sentences, and paragraphs, and also techniques to revise, edit, and proofread your communications. So very, very useful information for just about any possible career field. I think you'll find all of this useful, practical, and hopefully uh, enjoyable. <laughs> uh, at least it will improve your writing and ability to uh, communicate in a written fashion. So uh, with that said, let's get into it. Uh, so this first slide is about ways good writers write. And just as if you wanted to learn how to be a good baseball player, a good hockey player, uh, learn to play tennis, <laughs> whatever it is, it's very useful to be around people that are really good at those sports, right? And you imitate what they do. You figure out what, you know, what's your routine like? Uh, because it's proven to work. Uh, you know, the same thing with the bodybuilding. If you, you can get online and try to do your own research and you'll find a lot of misinformation. You don't know what to trust. Uh, but if you find people that are walking around with the kind of body that you want, uh, you know that whatever they're doing works. Uh, so you ask them about it and you uh, you do whatever they do, right? And so it's the same thing with writing. And what the, these researchers have done, they've, they've looked at professional writers, they've looked at uh, all kinds of writers actually, and, and discovered uh, that they have uh, things in common. And it's stuff that you probably don't do. Uh, so it's useful uh, to think about these. One is revising drafts. Uh, so instead of just sitting down and spitting out a perfect document you know nobody really does that it's it's all about the revision that's where you really start to hone uh, that piece of writing uh, habitual writing just writing something every day i tell uh, my students and i'll tell you uh, that if you write a little bit every day even if it's just a facebook post a tweet uh, maybe you keep a little blog a journal just anything as long as you just practice a little bit every day and uh, not, just, not just a grocery list, mind you, but you know, you're putting some effort into expressing yourself to somebody else, I think, is the key to that. Uh, big jobs into small chunks, uh, focusing on the purpose and the audience. Uh, so, again, with this one, you find a lot of writers say, well, it, you know, it makes sense to me. Well, it might make sense to you, but will it make sense to the person you're communicating with is usually the problem. Uh, choosing from several strategies, uh, knowing about those different strategies and being able to apply the one that makes sense, given that situation you're in. Uh, using rules flexibly. Uh, so the idea isn't that you ignore the rules and the idea isn't that you uh, uh, break the rules willy nilly. Uh, it's really about learning when it's OK to bend a rule, when it's OK to break a rule and uh, Again, that kind of comes back into this idea of the different strategies for the different audiences. And then finally, finishing the draft before editing the text. Uh, I used to work in the in a writing center, and this was probably the biggest one that I would run into. Students would be just stuck, sometimes even at the coming up with a title, right? So they're sitting there looking at a blank screen, and they're coming up with one title, delete it, try a different title. And they, they might be stuck there for hours, just editing or maybe they put a little paragraph down and they're not satisfied with that paragraph they keep working at it working at it <laughs> uh, so basically the idea is to finish it first get it done then you can go back in and start you know fixating on small issues basically uh, so anyway th these are some basic te techniques we'll get into this in much more detail as we go so the first step here is with uh, the planning phase, and you can save yourself a lot of time as a writer if you take some time first to plan out what it is you want to do. Uh, it starts analyzing the problem, uh, defining the purposes, analyzing the, the audiences. As in, in a classroom situation, you might have a, an assignment. Let's say you're supposed to write an essay or a memo or, or a report of some sort. And the first thing to do, of course, is to really look at the you know, what is the problem that's being posed there? Right? What, what can you learn from the instructions? Uh, what, what is the purpose of this assignment? What is the professor looking for? Uh, and then with the analyzing audiences, you might wonder, uh, what do I know about this professor's grading practices? What, what does he or she look for? 
uh, for example. And it's basically the same thing in the business world, right? I mean, you still got problems. They don't just tell you to write something for no reason. Uh, you're tasked with some kind of communication problem and you're trying to figure out, well, what is the purpose of the pamphlet? Or, or who's going to be reading these instructions or this policy? Uh, what is the, there must have been some kind of problem with communication before uh, that <laughs> otherwise there'd be no reason for you to be writing something. Uh, so the more you can figure out about the problem, maybe people are confused about a policy uh, or whatever it is, uh, the more you can know about these three things, the easier the writing will be. Uh, the second step here is just about brainstorming. Uh, sometimes you get a little stuck, you kind of get overwhelmed, and you're sort of spinning your wheels. You don't, you don't know what this, how, to, how to get started, basically. And so this brainstorming just means you just start writing out words that just pop into mind. You're not really uh, worrying about whether they're good ideas, bad ideas. It doesn't matter. You're just trying to get ideas down on paper because uh, you can always go back afterward and take out the ones that aren't any good. But it's easier if you have something on the page to work with. The blank page is what's really scary. Uh, gathering information, uh, selecting the points you want to make. Uh, so this might come back again to the brainstorming. So once you get a pretty good list, let's say you have 15, 20 points there, and then you can go back in and say, okay, uh, let me just take the top five points, the top 10 points, uh, whatever your time constraints are. And this is really helpful because you can weed out some of the stuff that would just make it, would just drag it out. Uh, and then choosing the organization pattern. Uh, what point basically do you want to mention first? What should come second? What should come third, etc. Uh, usually in a business document, anything concerned with safety is, or legal issues comes first. Uh, but again, it might vary. If it's a pamphlet, you might want to talk about the most exciting features first. Uh, or the low price, or whatever it may be. But the, the point here is that you're planning uh, for this. And once you have this planned out, the writing will be a lot easier. Now we're talking about sitting down to actually write it. So putting the ideas into words or paper or a screen, whatever the case may be. Uh, making a list. Uh, so sometimes what I do uh, first, if I'm writing, a, let's say I'm writing a little paragraph about a computer. Uh, I do a lot of writing about computers and platform, uh, video game platform histories and so on. Or uh, maybe you're just doing a review of a game. Or uh, you can think about a resume too. It's basically just kind of a list of uh, what you know, what jobs you've had, where you've gone to school, etc. Uh, so this can be an effective way to get started. Uh, you can always turn this list into a full paragraph as you as you uh, as you go along, right? But sometimes just starting with a quick even just a bulleted list is a good way to get started. Uh, same thing with developing, uh, developing headings. So if you say you have a 10 page report you, you want to write, <laughs> you have to write, uh, you can start thinking, well, what? maybe I'll have a heading there about uh, materials. And then somewhere down here, there might be a heading about features. Uh, maybe I want to have in there my, uh, some, my case study file, uh, whatever it is, you can just kind of start thinking about headings or you could think about a, one of those three ring binders and you'll have a uh, little tabs in there, right? For different sections. Uh, this is a good way here to uh, start thinking about organizing that document. Uh, just jotting down notes, good strategy. Um, Microsoft Word will let you, there's a feature called add comments and you can just paste those on uh, so that it, you, it doesn't mess up your text. You can just delete these later. A uh, stream of consciousness writing, uh, this is, a little bit weird, but here you're you really just step back. You're just writing whatever comes to mind. You're not thinking about editing, whether it makes sense. You're just, again, trying to get something on the paper uh, to work with. And a lot of times with the stream of consciousness, this is good if you're, I use this sometimes uh, when I'm doing some kind of creative writing. Uh, you just start writing out a story. Again, just whatever pops into mind. You're not really thinking about whether it's good or not. Uh, but if you do enough of this, uh, then you can develop some thought and then when you can just delete the stream of consciousness writing because uh, at that point you will have uh, you'll feel more confident and you'll have some ideas some characters worked out and i assume you could do the same with just about any kind of writing uh the partial drafts uh, so again not thinking about doing that whole thing in one big leap uh, a lot of times you might have 10 minutes to work on a document 
you work on it for 10 minutes. Uh, you got an hour left over. It's four o'clock. You don't go home till five. Well, an hour is not enough time to write the whole report, uh, but you could write part of it. You know, so it's all uh, we're kind of jumping the gun here with the idea about breaking it into chunks. But uh, those are just some ideas about composing. All right. So let's say you've got your plan. You've got your draft. It's still rough, obviously. So we need to take it from that rough state into something more polished, something more final. Well, how do you do it? It's not just about grammar. A lot of people think it's just about proofreading, but that's uh, that's going to come later. Uh, now we want to do some bigger picture stuff. So you're thinking, okay, let me let me remind myself, who is this for? <laughs> is it for an academic audience? Is this for customers? Is this for my managers? Is this for employees? Uh, the more you think about this, you can go back in and say, well, I've used some inappropriate language there. They won't know what those words mean. Uh, or I'm talking over there. I'm talking, uh, I'm being condescending to them. Obviously, the uh, engineers would know what, what these uh, terms mean. I don't need to explain the <laughs> this stuff. Uh, but you wouldn't know that if you weren't thinking about who's actually going to be reading this document. Uh, the goals. What is the goal? Is the goal to sell? Is it to just to, just to inform? Uh, you don't really need to write in a uh, sales uh, for your employees, right? Uh, they just need to know the <laughs> the facts. Uh, you don't need to persuade them to buy the product. Uh, the situation. Um, I like to use the example of the being on the airplane and having those safety pamphlets there in the seat ahead of you. Uh, it's a very different situation if the plane is having some kind of problems and people are looking at this pamphlet to figure out how to <laughs> inflate the life uh, vest or whatever it is. Uh, that's a very different situation than uh, being in a conference in an air-conditioned office somewhere and, and looking at a PowerPoint, right? So uh, you really need to think about that. Yeah, so will the audience understand it? If your audience doesn't even understand what it is you're trying to say, you know, that's, you know, what could be a bigger communication <laughs> uh, error than that? Uh, is it complete? So again, if the audience is uh, managers, uh, they they've already they already know a lot of the information. But what if the audience is clients? Maybe somebody just walked in, doesn't even know what kind of services you offer. You'd have to put a lot more information in there. And then uh, being convincing, again, this depends on purpose, right? Uh, friendly, uh, you'd probably want to be friendlier. This would probably be most important talking to uh, customers or clients. But uh, you could think too, uh, even uh, management talking to employee employees, uh, they want to be friendly too, create a positive work environment. Uh, nobody wants to be subjected to rudeness or disrespect. Uh, getting feedback from somebody else, uh, this is probably the most common. You know, I really want to lay some stress on this. Uh, the worst thing to do is just to hand in a document without having anybody else look at it, because uh, then you're just relying on your own opinion. And if you're really, really experienced, you can get away with that. But if you're new at the company, it never hurts, just never hurts. And even you know, I'm a professor and I've, I've got plenty of uh, colleagues and we have our own professional documents, promotion uh, packets and so on, <laughs> evaluation forms. And they're always, uh, they'll always have no shame whatsoever in coming to somebody like me and saying, hey, can you look at my material? Just kind of look it over, see if there's anything that looks wrong to you. You know, and these are professors asking this and they have no shame. Uh, so why should you, right? So yeah, if it's a resume, if it's a memo, if it's an email, if it's just anything, it never hurts to ask somebody, <laughs> even if it's your mom, uh, your significant other, uh, whoever, maybe even have your dog sniff at it and see if <laughs> the dog barks. <laughs> uh, feedback is good. Uh, adding, deleting, substituting, or rearranging uh, single words or, or large sections. Uh, so the revision stage is great for this. So you, you might decide, you know, I don't even need that, that, that page. I could just take out that page or I could take out that section. Uh, so you're doing all of this sort of big picture editing. Uh, this is also good if somebody, you know, say you had a resume and somebody, uh, you let your mom look at it and she says, hey, you know, you, you didn't talk about uh, your, uh, that, that award you received. Oh, well, you know, I don't even have a section here for <laughs> rewards or, or awards. You know, maybe I should add that. Uh, so this revision stage is when you do all this kind of big stuff. Now, so here we're talking about 
editing. So remember, the revision was the big picture stuff. Now you're getting down to the nitty gritty. You're, you're looking, you're reading it out loud. Uh, you're trying to find spots that are confusing or just awkward or uh, whatever it is, incorrect. <laughs> so, uh, so everybody focuses on uh, grammar and spelling. And they put a little note here, if you notice this heading standard English, uh, because the grammar and spelling, you know, it's not as if this is all written in stone. Uh, these rules will change over time, and some of these grammar rules uh, turn out to be uh, just kind of arbitrary. <laughs> they don't make a lot of sense sometimes, same thing with spelling. Uh, but if you violate these rules, then somebody might think that uh, you're ignorant or you're illiterate. You know, that's kind of unfortunate. So uh, it usually pays to at least make sure the you don't have words if you're using Microsoft Word or PowerPoint that's got stuff underlined in red, that might be a spelling error. So always worth looking at that. Uh, capitalization, punctuation. Again, this, these are rules. We could really get into the weeds on this stuff. Uh, the, the point really, I think, is if you if you have uh, if you know these rules, you, you spell check it, you capitalize it right, you have your commas in the right place. Uh, all of this stuff really makes it seem more professional, right? And, and people will take it a lot more seriously. Uh, if, on the other hand, there's all kinds of errors all over it, then people will look at it and say, well, that was sloppy, or they'll think you're uneducated. Uh, just, you know, that could be completely false, right? But it's giving that impression. So that, that's why we focus on this stuff. Uh, business principles, uh, of course, we talked about this uh, a couple lectures ago about the building of goodwill. Uh, the conventional formats actually i would say that ties into the goodwill uh, so you know if it's a resume that has a very conventional format and if you're violating that you know if you say well i i just really like this curly font you know <laughs> i want to use this curly font i like this font well that that's as may be but you're not following conventions and who's ever going to get this document might look at that and feel like you just thought it was a joke right or you didn't take their uh, the formatting seriously. You don't even really want the job. You know, so all of this, it's, it really all this stuff ties together. Uh, proofreading, correcting typographical errors. Uh, this, you know, you could, <laughs> you try your best to proofread. Uh, you'll always uh, find little stuff that slips through. Um, you probably even noticed in, in this textbook they will have the occasional error. So I don't know if it's even possible to get 100% uh, completely proofread, correct, you know, there's always going to be little stuff. Uh, the point really, though, I think, is to try to cut back and try to reduce it as much as possible. At least give the impression uh, that you spent some time proofreading. Uh, so for that, to that end, always say, uh, pay special attention to that first paragraph and the last paragraph. Uh, you know, if you have errors in the introduction and the conclusion, that's going to taint uh, the whole experience and the, the person might even assume it's just full of errors uh, maybe you only had a few errors in the intro uh, but since it's the first impression uh, that could get dragged down and they'll, they'll just say well you didn't proofread uh, well maybe you did but you didn't spend enough time on that intro uh, so again just proofread that first bit and the last bit especially hard um, because that's what will make the most impression All right, this is just some more about composing activities. Uh, they tell you you don't have to do it in a specific order. Uh, I like to spend a lot of time uh, planning, and then I'll just do the draft. And usually at some point as I'm drafting along, I'll kind of get bored or tired, just kind of run out of steam. Uh, so what I'll do is uh, switch into editing mode and just kind of go back to this part up here and maybe tweak the wording a little bit here, a little bit there, uh, maybe even... Uh, start making some headings for later on, you know, just kind of do that. And then maybe by this point, I'll build up some more steam and then I'll start <laughs> uh, drafting again. Uh, so the point is, you know, not to rigidly stick to a, a sequence. You know, you just kind of you're doing whatever you want to do at that at that moment. It's fine. Just as long as you're not just uh, putting it away and forgetting about it. I don't have to finish one to start another. Yeah, so that ties what into what I was saying there. Uh, don't have to use all activities for every message. Now, this is certainly true. If you think about it, if it's just a casual email to your 
a coworker, colleague, uh, they're probably not going to be too bothered by uh, a couple of errors here or there. If it was not perfectly uh, planned out, um, you know, especially brainstorming, it'd be a little weird if you sat down to brainstorm every time you wanted to post a, a Facebook <laughs> update to your friends, right? <laughs> Uh, but, you know, again, it's useful to know about brainstorming, so if it is uh, for a different occasion, that might be entirely appropriate. So now we're getting into uh, what they call half-truths about style. And there's eight of these, and we'll, we'll take them one at a time. I say these are things you might have heard uh, from another teacher. Or maybe one of your friends told you, your parents told you, but there, there's all these sort of guidelines or rules or people think there are these hardcore rules that you just have to follow <laughs> you're wrong <laughs> what we find a lot of times though is this there's a little bit of truth to it uh but probably not it's probably not as rigid as you thought it was uh, so let's, let's get into these now uh, the first one is to write as you talk uh, i'll say yeah well don't try to write in a stodgy fashion don't try to sound too intelligent or whatever it is just just write the way you talk and and sometimes it does make sense uh, they say yeah if it's the first draft uh, this can be great you know when you're drafting you're not worried so much about uh, the exact wording uh, you're just trying to get some ideas out on paper and so it's fine um, read the draft aloud to test it another good strategy uh, if you have a hard time Reading the sentence you wrote out loud, you know, if, if it doesn't sound right, uh, or you're kind of stumbling as you're reading it, it or you run out of breath, it probably means that something's wrong there, and you should go back in and edit this some more. Uh, the problem is, if you do try to write down exactly as you talk, uh, you'll find that you're putting a lot of you knows, and uhs, and okays, and <laughs> what I really meant was blah, blah, blah. As you're doing a lot of that sort of stuff in speech, and that's to be expected because when you're speaking, you're just having to come up with stuff off the top of your head. Uh, you can't go back in and change up a word here. <laughs> uh, you can go back. You can say, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, let me try to say that again. You can do that sort of thing. Uh, but in writing, you, you just would delete that part, right? And you just write it uh, the way you wanted to say it, if, you know, if that makes sense. So it, you expect writing to be a lot better organized than a speech. Uh, because you can, yeah, revise and edit <laughs> the writing. You have more time to get it right, and you can correct mistakes instead of just, uh, with, with a speech situation, you just have to say, whoops, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I messed up, let me, uh, I used the wrong word, or whatever. Uh, in speech, you can, or uh, in writing, you can revise and edit all that stuff out. Another one is this, uh, you can't ever use uh, I, and we did talk about it, before how it does it can make it seem like you're only focused on your your own interest uh, we talked about the you centric versus the i centric we'll talk a little bit more about that here uh, but yeah a lot of the times uh, it really doesn't matter who the author of the document is the important thing is the information you're getting across there's, there's no reason it's almost like oversharing <laughs> like what do you have to do with this just just give me the information that i need <laughs> to do the job i don't care about your feelings or you know, you, you're not really part of this <laughs> information. Sometimes you are, sometimes you're not. Uh, that's the key. Uh, I can make ideas uh, seem tentative. Yeah, this is the problem if you're saying things like, well, in my opinion, or uh, here's what I think. If you say, here's what I think, or here's the way I think it should be done. It, it sounds like you're saying, yeah, but there's lots of other ways that it could be done. And, and you're just have the, you're just giving your way and it might not be the best way. <laughs> Uh, so unless that's what you want to communicate, you might want to rethink that. And let's say use I to tell what you did, said, or saw. Yeah, of course. You know, if you're talking about your own experience, of course you use I. And I've even seen authors do weird stuff where they'll talk about, they'll say something like, well, the author of this report says, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Like, what? Uh, why didn't they just say I? Or you know, Sometimes it makes perfect sense to bring in I and your own experience. If it's relevant, right? If it's not, well, don't use it. And here we're talking about the opposite. So that other one was about using I. We said, yes, yeah, it's, it's perfectly fine to use I in some, some situations. And same thing with the word you. Uh, we even said how to hold 
part of that lecture on goodwill about the you-centered writing and making sure that the reader knows it's relevant to them. Uh, there's some other cases, though. If it's, if it's a familiar audience, you know, if this is your friend, coworker, if it's an email, obviously there's nothing wrong with using you there because the person reading it, you know who the person reading it is, right? Uh, describing audience benefits, this, this kind of comes back to that uh, you-centered stuff. I, I, don't, I won't repeat all that here. Uh, when should you not use you, though? Uh, formal reports, of course, academic writing, is, you very seldom see it. Uh, any, basically, any time where formality is required. So uh, that's really the key. If it's something that you want to sound more friendly, uh, then using you is fine. Uh, but you don't necessarily want to be friendly in a, a real formal report. Right? You, you want to kind of emphasize the uh, relevance of the information, the importance of the occasion, uh, something like that. And using you is uh, that will make it seem informal. So just just be wary of that. And then here's another one: this this idea of starting sentences with and or but. Uh, now, most grammarians will tell you that is a comma, or it's a uh, sentence fragment. If I have a sentence that says, uh, and you know <laughs> what happened next, period, uh, they'll say that's a sentence fragment, you know, because you started with and or but. Uh, so technically, this is a grammar, you're breaking the rules of grammar, I guess. Uh, but nevertheless, you do see it all the time. If you read <laughs> pretty much anything, you'll see authors, professional writers, Starting sentences with and or but, and it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, so, so what's going on with that? Well, they give you some points here about how it, it might seem, if you put and in front of a sentence, it might seem like an afterthought, and it might seem like an afterthought. Right? So you kind of hear what I did there. Uh, so if you have a sentence, it almost seems like you're just tacking something on, uh, which, which could make it look a little sloppy, like you didn't do very good editing, because if it was important, you should have gone back in and edited the sentence to, to put it in there, right? Uh, however, it does make it seem uh, more natural, like more conversational, again, more friendly approach. And but is uh, pretty much the opposite of and, right? This is the I say, um, I'm about to say something that contradicts what I just said. <laughs> I'm about to give an exception. Uh, so for that way, it, it's giving a, they call it a shift here, or signpost kind of see it as a, um, I guess one of those signs that you, know, you see on the highway, like a curve coming. <laughs> it's like, but, I said, I'll let you know, we're, we're going to go in a different direction here pretty soon. Maybe the, uh, we're going to take a hard turn, uh, but it can make the writing smoother. So here's another, this is a really good, a good uh, example here of where, yeah, technically it's wrong to say and or but at the start of a sentence. On the other hand, People do it all the time because it does make it seem more natural, can make it seem smoother. And you don't always want that rigid sort of formality all the time. And here's this uh, preposition one. Uh, so this would be like saying, uh, uh, that is a policy I don't approve of. So you got the of there at the end, and that's a, uh, a preposition <laughs> technically. Uh, you shouldn't end a sentence with that, of. Uh, but again, people do it all the time. It's it's almost pedantic to insist on a rule like this. Uh, really, you know what I where, where I find people that emphasize this stuff so much. It's it's when you're dealing with an, an editor or an audience uh, that learned what I well I, I like to put it this way. They learned English out of a book, <laughs> uh, so they don't they're not native speakers. Uh, but they they really know their grammar and rules, spelling rules, and all that stuff. They probably know them a lot better than, than I do, and and they're the type of folks that will say, "Look, this is wrong. You ended that sentence with the preposition," and you'd you'd probably look at that and say, "Well, yeah, but uh, that's fine. You know, it makes it makes sense. This is how we do it." <laughs> but they keep saying, "No, it's it's wrong," uh, because again, they're they're following the formal rules and they, they probably know those rules a lot better than, than you do. Uh, so there's certainly situations where, yeah, okay, uh, if you end sentences with a preposition for that audience, 
uh, they'll be looking at your writing and saying, this person's illiterate. <laughs> this person doesn't know English. <laughs> uh, whereas for other, other time, most other audiences, though, would, they wouldn't even notice it. And so it's a good example there of the understanding there's different audiences out there with different expectations. Anyway, let's see what they put here. Uh, a preposition may not be worth emphasizing this way. You know, this is it's true that you normally want to put something important at the end of a sentence. You don't want to end on a word like of, because uh, that's just kind of a, it, it doesn't really do anything. It's just kind of a meaningless sound, really. Uh, so instead of saying, I don't, that is a policy of I do not approve of, you could rewrite that and say, I do not approve of that. Uh, I do not approve of that of that policy. So you end it with the word policy instead of the word of. Uh, so just to, that's an emphasis emphasis uh, issue there. Uh, readers expect something to follow a preposition. Uh, again, especially if you are not really, if you if you're not a native speaker, if you haven't been around English your whole life, uh, this would look odd. It would look like a mistake. Uh, avoid in job application letters, reports, and formal presentations. Uh, so again, uh, anything that's really formal, that's important, significant, that you want to <laughs> present it as though we're wearing a suit and tie. <laughs> well, you, you don't want to do stuff like this because this, this is uh, too conversational, it's too informal. Yeah, it makes sense, but it'd be kind of like using y'all and, and ain't or cursing. <laughs> it just doesn't belong there. You want to present a more serious uh, style. But it's okay now and then. Well, let's take a look at this one. Uh, never use sentences with more than 20 words or paragraphs and more than eight lines. Wow. Uh, you know, this sounds like it might be a decent uh, rule of thumb, I guess, or just kind of a general guideline to follow. But it really would be ridiculous, I think, to be counting every word uh, for every sentence and saying, oh, that one's 18. I got to add two words. <laughs> it's just silly. Uh, on the other hand, I say it's kind of a good general rule uh, because nobody likes huge paragraphs or long sentences. It's just really super tedious. It's uh, it's better to have a, a, a sort of some variation. We'll get more into that. Uh, but again, a lot of this stuff you can solve if you just read it out loud because you'll hear, wow, that's a long sentence. <laughs> I ran out of breath. <laughs> well, maybe you should cut some words out of that or find a way to put in some punctuation. Uh, let's see if they have anything else there. Uh, yeah, you could have a long sentence with parallel clauses. Uh, well, I think they'll probably talk more about this, but um, if uh, let's just save this until we get to that, uh, the slides about the uh, different kinds of sentences. Uh, longer paragraphs of bulleted lists may be clear. Oh, that's certainly true. You could have a very uh, you know, bulleted lists are usually very easy to follow. Uh, I would add to this, though, that the bulleted lists, what, what a guideline I follow with this is they're only useful if you have a relatively short item. You know, it looks really weird to me to have bullets and like that, you know, five or six sentences and then more bullets with that. You know, I don't like this. I think bullets are great for little short lists, you know, maybe where you're listing ingredients or just short little policies are great. Uh, not so good if you have a uh, paragraph long uh, items there. But anyway, just kind of coming back to the gist of this uh, idea. Um, what you do want to be aware of more than anything else is not going on for too long and also not going, uh, not having lots of short, very short sentences back to back. It's what we call choppy. So you might have a real choppy sentence or you might have one that just goes on forever and people fall asleep before they get <laughs> to the end of it. <laughs> As a somewhere in between those two extremes is, is, is where you want to be. So this is a slide about big words and trying to impress people. And you probably know people like this. They get a hold of a thesaurus or they, they think they have to use a, a huge word or a very technical term every few minutes <laughs> to kind of show you how smart they are. Uh, sometimes it works, but yeah, you know I like to think the audiences that are fooled by that are, are probably not all that bright to begin with. Uh, really, you just want to use vocabulary that suits the occasion. Uh, if you're talking to experts that will understand the technical terms, fine. Uh, if you're talking to students, they're just going to get confused. Uh, they're not going to, I guess they might think, wow, this person's intelligent. Listen to that vocabulary. 
Uh, but they might also be thinking, uh, wow, what a horrible teacher. I can't even understand a, what a word this person's saying. I, don't, I have no idea what they're telling me. <laughs> These instructions make no sense. <laughs> uh, so again, you, somewhere in between the extremes, right? Uh, so they get some points here. Yeah, the big words distance you from the audience. And sometimes people do this on purpose, right? I, I see this in that, that legalese uh, doc. You know, you're asking the doctor, well, uh, what's wrong with me, doc? <laughs> and they just start sort of uh, hammering you with this medical jargon. You just have no idea. Like, what? Uh, what is that? And you kind of realize you have no clue. <laughs> and so the idea there is just, well, th this person obviously knows more than you do. So you should just shut up and, and take the medicine. Uh, basically, right? So I would say that's not a very good communication strategy. You, you don't really want to do that. Uh, what you really want, you know, if that doctor is a good communicator, uh, they'll just be able to explain uh, what it is and, and why this medication will be effective in a way that you'll understand it. And that will really be better communication. Uh, big words may be misunderstood. You know, not everybody's going to take the time to look it up in the dictionary and even if they do, there might be three or four different definitions for that word. Uh, so again, you're trying to communicate here, you're not trying to confuse. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, and then, yeah, this last one here, misused words uh, make you look foolish. Uh, so the general rule there is if you don't know the, if you're not used to seeing the word in print, or you're not used to hearing people say the word, uh, you shouldn't use it. Uh, yeah, you can jump on a thesaurus, you can get some synonyms and you can really use some obscure words. Uh, it's probably not going to make people think you're smarter. It's probably going to be make you look dumber <laughs> because a lot of the times those words don't exactly, uh, they don't mean the exact thing that you think they do. Like a, one of the ones I think about a lot is a word like murder. Uh, if you look that up in the thesaurus, you might say, well, there's kill, there's eliminate, uh, there's maybe even delete. You know, words like that. And then you think, does delete mean the same thing as murder? You know, clearly not. Uh, but somebody that didn't know the word, didn't really know those definitions. Again, maybe they don't really know English that well. Uh, they just see, well, it says there that delete is the same as murder. Uh, so I can use those interchangeably. <laughs> it ends up looking silly. Uh, so anyway, the, the general idea here is just make sure you know the words. Don't try to talk above the audience or... Uh, trying to impress them with just vocabulary that they won't probably won't even know what the heck <laughs> you're talking about. It's not going to make you a better communicator. It's just going to make it worse. And this slide here is about documenting sources. Uh, it is true that uh, usually academics are the ones that are most concerned and scientists, are, they're really concerned about um, you know, if you got the ideas from somewhere else, you need to document that and you need to cite it correctly using MLA or APA or whatever, the Chicago, whatever the case may be. Uh, in writing, business writing, though, they don't, you know, have a lot of this it's same stuff, uh, citations and, and a work cited page, <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, and they, furthermore, like they say here, they do use a lot of boilerplate. So you might have the same letter. Uh, it goes out to 50,000 different people, right? And all they'll change is just a few words to make it appropriate uh, for that particular purpose, right? But most of that letter will be just what they call boilerplate, just the same stuff that's just copied and pasted over and over again. It's not plagiarism because it's, you know, they want you to use it, right? This is a perfectly acceptable. Uh, however, there's still some situations where you can get in trouble. Uh, one, of course, is copyright infringement. If I'm trying to sell my tractor, if I'm selling tractors and I just say, well, let me just pop over to the John Deere website and I like the way they describe that tractor. I'll just copy and paste that and dump it over here. <laughs> well, that, that's probably going to get me uh, in trouble with the law. So that was copyright infringement. Uh, I shouldn't have uh, even been looking at this. I need to come up with my own words for my tractor. You know, that I'm sure you understand the, the reason somebody got paid to do this, right? It's they worked hard on that description. They don't want me just copying it. You know, that's, that's plagiarism. I need to do my own work. Uh, or it could just be uh, maybe I want to use maybe I found a website there with some expert opinions on it. Dr. So and so, you know, said that. 
So it's usually fine in business writing just to, just to acknowledge it. So you just would say something like, well, according to Dr. Barton, uh, blah, 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 blah. So you don't have to have a formal citation, works cited page, whatever. Uh, the important thing is that you acknowledged where it came from. And let's see if the source is not widely, if the source is not widely, uh, I think that should be known. <laughs> it's kind of funny that we're, this lecture where we're talking about proofreading and, you know, look, see this this textbook publisher, uh, they let a little, uh, a little error slip through there, right? It should be known. Uh, but, you know, it happens. So don't be too critical if you see uh, your friend doing this or, uh, or whoever, because even these professional textbook publishers can make little mistakes. So that, that, let's just make that a teachable moment. Anyway, it says there, if the source is not widely known or was controversial, it's best uh, to acknowledge it. Uh, so if you're taking source, you know, this, is, this could kind of derail your whole argument, right? If they find out uh, that you're, you're basing your information on uh, some kind of controversial source, well, that's, <laughs> a lot of times this comes up with uh, companies like Monsanto, right? And Monsanto got this sort of ominous vibe to it, and uh, people will question uh, that they just think they must be full of lies if it comes from Monsanto. Uh, well, maybe it does, uh, maybe it doesn't. But the point here is if you don't acknowledge where the information came from and people find out later, it makes it seem like you were trying to hide it, right? You're trying to keep that secret, which makes you look a lot more suspicious uh, than if you just acknowledged it uh, from the get-go. Uh, so these are all good practices. All right, so now we're getting into some ways to make your writing easier to read. Uh, first one is just choosing the words, uh, using accurate, appropriate, familiar words. Uh, we, we talked about that. Uh, avoiding the jargon, uh, eliminating the, the business jargon. And the book gave a pretty good example there about MBAs and how a lot of uh, MBAs, uh, they sort of talk a certain way. They use a lot of jargon. I would say that's not just true of... Uh, MBAs, though. I, I see it just about every field, anywhere uh, there's experts. Uh, they're using a lot of this stuff, but if you or I were to read it, we would say, wow, that's just so much jargon. Why, do they, why can't they just write in plain English? Well, to them, it is plain English. Right? See, that, that's the key to this. Uh, to them, it is, it is clear. It's just not clear to you because you're not uh, hip to the jargon. Uh, so really what that is, is it's an audience issue. If, the, if, the, if they're trying to communicate to the general audience and they're using their jargon, uh, that's just com that's a communication error uh, 101, right? They should have thought, just take a couple minutes to realize, well, my audience isn't going to know what, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, <laughs> trying to think of some uh, good jargon to use. Uh, uh, something like uh, from C, C++ and they got their pointers and uh, memory allocations and uh, classes. <laughs> yeah, classes might be a good one to use. So if, talk, if you're talking about programming and you're talking about classes, uh, that means something very specific to a programmer. But just to a layperson, they probably think you're talking about a, a, like a class in school, right? Or a, a class of person. Uh, so a good example there, of, you know, if you don't need the jargon, uh, maybe you should take it out because it might just lead to needless confusion. Now right, here we're talking about accurate and appropriate words. And the key to this is thinking about the denotation of the word and the connotation. So the denotation, denotation is what would be in the dictionary. And the connotation are emotions associated with it, attitudes. And the, a really good example, I think, and it's a little, maybe a little bit crude. You might sound crude, but the word bitch. Oh, well, uh, maybe I should <laughs> write it out there. <laughs> so if you just look it up in the dictionary, it's just, you know, the female dog, right? And if you know people that have dogs, dog breeders, uh, they use that word all the time. Uh, it's not a curse word. It's just a technical term, right? It's just, it's nothing offensive about it uh, in that context. But uh, of course, there's this connotation, especially as soon as you get away from like dog breeding and dog shows and stuff like that, and you start using the word. Uh, even if you are using it to describe uh, your dog, uh, somebody might think, wow, I can't believe you just called your dog that. 
<laughs> what, do you not like your dog? <laughs> uh, what's going on? Uh, and there's a problem here with the uh, denotation and connotation. And you can say all day long, say, well, look, I'm using it in the dictionary meaning. Uh, you know, I don't mean that uh, I'm not putting down the dog. I'm not being offensive. It doesn't. That's not the point, right? The, the point is this, uh, that word is not appropriate for that audience uh, that's not used to hearing it used that way. Uh, so just a classic case there. Now, the book goes into some different examples here that, you know, if you have two different ways to describe something, um, maybe these mean the same thing in terms of a denotation, nosy and curious. You know, those, those might show up as in a thesaurus as meaning the same thing. But if you think about it, if you call somebody nosy, it's kind of a negative thing, right? They're like they, they shouldn't be nosy. Uh, that that person's got an undesirable trait. If you say though they're curious, you know that sounds a little uh, better. It's, you know, it's like well, it's good to be curious. It's good to have intellectual curiosity and so on. <laughs> and say fearful and cautious, obstinate versus firm. You know, you could say stubborn there. I think nobody wants to be stubborn or obstinate. Uh, being firm uh, sounds a little better, right? You say all sells. I'm a very, I'm very stubborn about the price. Uh, that doesn't sound good. If I say I'm very firm about the price, uh, somehow that sounds a little better. <laughs> Tax uh, versus a uh, user fee. Oh wow, there we go. <laughs> so not, I'm not taxing. So we're not talking about a tax. Talking about a user fee. <laughs> I don't even know how ethical that, that one is. But anyway, you get the idea here. I think it'd be fun, too, to... I want to hear some of your examples of uh, some, some words that... Uh, yeah, it's maybe they're synonymous you know, on the one hand, but they do have this clear negative uh, and positive uh, connotation. So let's take a, some time to think about some of those. All right, here's just some points about... Uh, using familiar words, uh, words that most people know, uh, words that can best convey your meaning. Uh, so sometimes you might have a situation where, yeah, there's a word uh, like database, right? And you need to talk about databases. You know the audience uh, doesn't probably won't know uh, what the word means. Nevertheless, you need to <laughs> you have to use it. Uh, so it's, it's fine to use it. You just need to explain it uh, first, right, for that audience. Uh, shorter, more common words. And again, think about the international, global en environment that we're working in these days. Uh, more than likely, your document will have to be translated. And it's a lot easier to translate a document if it's just short, common words. Uh, the algorithms are, are good for that, even like Google, Google Translate. Uh, the fan, Basically, the fancier the uh, you try to get in terms of style, uh, the more confusion is going to be, <laughs> uh, the more confusion will result in that translation. So uh, a big factor uh, in business writing, you're usually not writing to impress people with your uh, command of the vernacular, whatever that means, right? You're just trying to communicate some bit of information. Uh, so just keep it simple. Yeah, specific concrete words, uh, avoiding all those long, lengthy prepositional phrases or complicated sentences. Uh, you don't need it at the sentence level. You certainly don't need it at the word level. Uh, so here's just some simple uh, examples here. It's, they say uh, they got a stuffy column. So it's kind of stuffy, they say, to say, I reside. Uh, where do you, where are you from? Well, I reside in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Uh, this seems a little stuffy, right? And you just, who would say that, right? You just say, I, I live in St. Cloud. Uh, com commence and begin. Let us commence. <laughs> uh, look at that. I will now enumerate the ingredients for the cake. Uh, I'm kind of being a little silly here, but I, I, you really do. You might be just using these words thinking, oh, well, let me just, uh, I should say utilize. You know, that sounds so much better than just use. I, I will utilize a pencil. <laughs> Hopefully, though, you're seeing this. This is just sounding silly. Um, people will be more impressed, I think, with a lot of times with, the, with what you're saying, more so than, than how you're saying it or how you're, put it this way, but how you're using uh, these uh, rare words 
uh, that you got out of a thesaurus, uh, that's not really very impressive. Uh, what's really be impressive is if you communicate well, if you communicate clearly, if you get your point across. Uh, that's what that's what's impressive uh, to a communicator. Uh, so now we're getting into one of my favorite topics of jargon, and I, I just think that even the word jargon is it's kind of funny that they would use this word because it's not really a common word. A lot of people don't like what is jargon. <laughs> so already you have a technical term basically for technical terms. It's kind of weird, uh, but anyway. You would, uh, they, they say here you should probably avoid it. Imagine, you know, just as, an, as an English teacher, I use jargon all the time. I talk to students and I have to be aware of it. You know, it wouldn't be very helpful to you if I said, well, you know, I've looked at your paper and I noticed some, uh, there's some comma splices. You have some missing commas with non-restrictive elements. Uh, and look, look over here, we have a <laughs> dangling modifier. <laughs> uh, so all of that stuff is just jargon. If you don't know what it means, I might as well just be sitting here singing uh, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious over and over. It's just nonsense to you. You don't know what those words mean. Uh, so I need to uh, either define the words, you know, if it's if you, if you need to know, maybe I say, well, look, they need to know what a comma splice is. So I would have a lecture. I would say, look, here's a comma splice. Here's what it means. Uh, see if you can recognize this a couple of times. And then and once you get the concept, uh, then I can just use a uh, comma splice and you'll you'll get it. But again, if I don't take that first step, I'm just being confusing. It's a communication uh, error. So uh, avoid that. They, they, they point out job application letters here uh, because so many people make this really silly mistake. Well, I don't know how silly it is, but naive anyway. Uh, they think that the person that's going to be looking at their cover letter and their resume is an expert in the field. So if I'm if I want to be a security, uh, you know, information security, blah blah blah, analyst, <laughs> database expert, whatever, and I submit my letter and I'm using all the jargon uh, from the field, the the person, uh, let's just say the person reviewing it just might be the typical human resources expert or human resources personnel hiring. Uh, they they may know nothing about databases and software and all this jazz uh, they don't it's not their job they're just there to review the resumes make sure you have the appropriate documents there uh, that you have the requisite skills that they're calling for and that and that job ad and all that jargon just confusing them and they, they might actually not they might actually misread it somehow and think that you don't have the right qualifications so uh, again Knowing uh, how to say that stuff <laughs> without the jargon is uh, essential. And so here's some example, <laughs> business ease. <laughs> Needless old fashioned wording. Uh, so let's see what some examples here. And so I guess this would be in your cover letter. You might say, enclosed, please find my resume. So they just say, you could say, as an alternative, here is my resume. Uh, as per your request, uh, I, ooh, oh, look at that one. I acknowledge receipt of the, the undersigned. So they just say omit this. I don't, I don't think they should just say omit it entirely because there are certainly cases where you do want to be more formal. You do want to sound more, uh, uh, what's the word? More official, I guess, and this would be appropriate. Uh, but you need to be aware that it could come off as being real stodgy, real stuffy, you know, especially if you're writing to colleagues or maybe you're the type of manager or supervisor. Uh, you, you don't want to sound like, you know, you're too buttoned up all the time. Maybe you want to have a little bit more uh, collegiality uh, with your employees. So you use something like, <laughs> uh, as you asked, uh, here's, here is the uh, policy. Instead of all this kind of, you'd almost think of a robot. Enclosed, please find resume document. <laughs> you know, that, that's just a little too stodgy. Well, let's see. Ten ways to make your writing easy to read uh, continued. And I think we'll get into these uh, one, one by one. Uh, <clears throat> we're talking about active voice. Uh, using the verbs to carry the weight of that sentence. Uh, eliminating wordiness varying uh, the sentences, 
uh, parallel structure and putting the readers into your sentences. So we'll take these one at a time. And so this one's about active voice. And uh, they say the subject of the sentence does action, the verb describes, uh, that's the active, uh, whereas the, the passive one, the subject is acted upon. And so the active might be, um, yeah, let's, let's see, I wrote a resume. So I wrote a resume. So the, the I there is what did the writing. Or passive would be, the resume was written by me. Uh, so there the subject of that sentence is the resume, but that didn't do the writing. Uh, so that's why they call it passive. It's kind of passing it on. Maybe it's just passing it right out of the sentence. I could just say the resume was written and not even say who it was. Uh, so it's fun to do this. I'm sure we'll get into this here in a second, but um, it's better to be more active than passive. If you have too many passive sentences back to back to back, it gets really boring and tedious. This is the reason why uh, so much scientific writing and lab reports, uh, they tend to use a lot of passive and it just gets you, you basically fall asleep before you get done reading it. It just gets so boring. And uh, the reason for that, of course, is uh, we like to think about people doing things and, and action. We're kind of action oriented people. Uh, we don't like just to read this uh, information without any sort of clear idea of what's being done, uh, who's doing it. Uh, that just gets more and more abstract, more and more boring. Oh yeah, here's, here's some examples. <laughs> okay, so P is the passive and A is the active. And so in the passive one, the, uh, the program will be implemented by the agencies. So you see there that the program is the subject of that uh, verb will be implemented, but the program didn't implement anything. The agencies did. So you could rewrite this to say the agencies will implement the program. So this is uh, the verb there will implement who's doing it? Who's doing the implementing? Well, it's the subject of the sentence. The, the agencies is doing the implementing. So they're saying there that this, this one here is easier to understand. It's obviously shorter. It's clearer. It's more interesting. Uh, let's look at the other example. Uh, passive. These benefits are received by you. <laughs> That's just awkward. <laughs> I don't know anybody would write that. Uh, you receive these benefits. All right, uh, passive. A video was ordered. Active. Uh, the customer ordered a video. So hopefully you're getting the idea here. Uh, you got the verb there, was ordered. Who did the ordering? Well, it's not even in the sentence. We don't even know who ordered it. Uh, whereas in the second one, this customer ordered the video and they put the customer there as the subject of the sentence. So it's really clear who did the verb. And they've also got the, this, this bit here of video is called the, uh, uh, the object. All right, let's see. Active voice is better because shorter. Well, yeah, we saw that. Uh, clearer, yes. A lot of times if it's an active, you can use context, what they used to call context clues to kind of figure out the meaning of a sentence. Even if you don't know all the words, uh, sometimes just the structure can be a clue. Now, more interesting, yeah, because we're, <laughs> we like action <laughs> as humans and we want to see people doing things, uh, so that makes it more interesting. Uh, passive voice, though, does have some advantages. Uh, one, it can emphasize, emphasize the object receiving the action. Uh, one of the examples I like to give students is back when, if you look at the headlines around when JFK was assassinated, uh, the headlines are just simply two words, uh, JFK shot, exclamation point, JFK shot. And the reason for that was it was a lot more significant to people who was shot. Like This is the president. You know, that is very significant. Uh, they probably wouldn't even know who Lee Harvey Oswald, who, nobody knew who that was. It wouldn't have made any sense. Think about a headline that says, Lee Harvey Oswald shoots uh, JFK, exclamation, part, ex exclamation point. Well, it doesn't make sense to, to put it that way because nobody knew who he was. He's not the significant part. What's far more important is who uh, was shot You know, if that, in, in that situation. So that's, that's just one example. Uh, give coherence by repeating the word in the previous sentence. 
know, this is certainly true. I will probably get more into this in, in a second. But when you end a sentence with something, it's nice when you start that next sentence uh, to make a little bridge there, make this make this a little connection here uh, between these thoughts. And sometimes a passive voice is a way to do it. Well, let's see, avoiding placing the blame. <laughs> yeah, so for this, uh, uh, you, your mom comes in and like, oh, uh, why, why do you look so scared? What, what happened? Uh, you say, well, the, the cookie jar was broken. <laughs> <laughs> right or the pie was eaten <laughs> so you're not really saying i broke the jar or, i ate the pie <laughs> you kind of leave that out. leave that little tidbit out and that's kind of again kind of a silly example but in a business situation that might be whether you get sued or not is uh, whether that uh, blame was put in the memo Uh, this is a slide about using the verb uh, to carry the weight and it really has to do with just the structure of your predicate or the structure of your verb you know, in a sentence if, if you're saying something like make an adjustment uh, you see how convoluted this is really make an adjustment where is the actual what what is actually being done here what is the real uh, kernel here what is the uh, what, what is where is the actual verb and you find it here with, with adjust and so you kind of turned adjust into adjustment and then stuck make an in front of it just, just too convoluted you could just say adjust uh, make a decision decide well tomorrow I will make a decision as to blah 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 you could just say tomorrow I will decide who gets the promotion uh, perform an examination versus examine, take into consideration, consider. Uh, and again, they, they kind of presenting this here as hard rules, which is kind of weird, but considering the, the other stuff. But I would say sometimes, again, if you want to sound more formal, maybe you don't want to just rush in to say decide or adjust. Or maybe you think perform an examination sounds a little bit more uh, impressive than just saying examine. Uh, there's certainly cases where that's true and you would want to use one of these uh, ones from the left so it's not that these are just wrong you should never use it it's just that you probably shouldn't use it if you're trying to be clear if you're trying to communicate uh, communicate efficiently you could just use one of these shorter ones but i would say there's definitely times when you'd want to use those longer ones all right now we're getting into wordiness and I always tell students that the problem with this is that when you're coming up through school, your teacher says, uh, I want this paper to be three pages long. You say, okay. And then you, you write everything you can think of to say about the topic and you're, oh, you've only got the one page. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> well, a lot of uh, what you probably do, what anybody would do, you just start padding all the sentences out, right? So instead of just saying, because... Right, that's just one word you could replace that with due to the fact that <laughs> wow <laughs> that just that's if i do that for every time i write because and look all those times i say and i could change that to as well as <laughs> and, you know pretty soon you just end up with just a wordy piece of you know what just it's garbage uh, so that's usually the problem and then you get you get good at that in school and it becomes a bad habit uh, so now we have to try to break the habit because in, in business writing, you don't want something wordy. Wordy is bad. Uh, wordy is wasted money because it's taking people longer to read something and, and that's not good. Uh, so we want, we want instead is something called concision, or concise, another bit of jargon there, just basically being able to say it with fewer words. And they say it's a mark of good writing. I would agree with that. Uh, a lot of times, uh, Sometimes the, the students uh, chagrin. Uh, there's a fancy word for you. <laughs> uh, I'd say, you know what? I could I could rewrite that this this essay you wrote in, into th three or four sentences, and basically say all, say the same stuff. You know, they say that's <laughs> well, don't do that. <laughs> That'll make it even shorter. <laughs> I'm trying to get to you know three pages here. Uh, but think about this in the business right business uh, communication that would actually be better. Uh, you don't need to go on for three pages. You know, if you can say it in one page, hey, 
That just means you're a great business communicator. Not, it's not bad at all. So you kind of have to rethink that whole, if you're in that mentality that you just need to write as many words as possible, uh, try to get out of that habit. Start thinking instead about uh, shorter sentences. It's not like you're cutting out so much it doesn't make sense. You're just cutting out stuff that doesn't need to be there. So omitting the words that say nothing. Uh, combining the sentences to save words, another great tactic. Uh, the second one here is good too for choppy. So if you have a bunch of little short sentences, if you can combine those, it not only makes it easier to read and maybe save some words, but it gets rid of that choppy problem. And uh, we just talked about that, putting the meaning in the subject and the verb. All right, so let's look at some examples of these. Uh, so cutting the words if the idea is clear without them. So how to omit needless words. Uh, so period of three months uh, at the present time. You know, could you cut that out? Do you need that? Do you need to say at the present time? <laughs> or is it, uh, can the reader figure that figure it out? Well, if you're, re if you're writing it now, you're probably talking about now. Uh, do you need to say <laughs> at the present time? Why would you be writing about tomorrow or yesterday? Uh, let's see, replace wordy phrases with one word. Uh, ideally, it would be best to put the, if possible, put the, uh, there are three reasons for our success. Uh, three reasons explain the, uh, so you see what they're doing there. They're just kind of taking these, these long strings and condensing them. All right, here's some examples of how to combine sentences to save words. Uh, so the first one is infant or uh, infant projected sales of 43 million in the first quarter. Our actual sales have fallen short of that figure by 1.9 million. So it's not it's not saying this is totally confusing or you just can't you can't figure out what the heck they're saying or it's hopelessly wordy. Uh, it's just it could be tightened up. They they could tighten this up to make the meaning clearer and to lose some uh, extra words. So let's just see what they've uh, how they fixed it. Revise it, I should say. Uh, although in font projected first quarter sales of 43 million, actual sales are 1.9 million less than that. So if you if you really say these out loud a couple times to yourself, you'll, you'll sort of get a feel for it's uh, the the way that they've arranged the sentence and put certain ideas together in it. It makes it a little easier. This this although is uh, particularly uh, important because that sort of sets up the the structure of the sentence better. Uh, so when you use a word like although, you're signaling to the uh, reader that you're going to say something that makes makes it sound one way, but then you're going to turn around and surprise them with something else. So it's just a way to structure a sentence where you're forecasting a little bit. Uh, when you hear me say, if I start off a sentence with although, although, blah, 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 <laughs> you can almost... Uh, imagine just plugging in words to that and you already sort of know the gist of the sentence even with just blah 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 and so kind of going on about this what seems like a little thing but if you really look closely here you, you can see uh, how the second one is not only I wouldn't just say tighter it's not just that they've cut some words uh, but it's actually clearer all right putting meaning of sentence into the subject and verb uh, so here's where we're really getting into wordiness issues. We can really just <laughs> visualize <laughs> uh, the difference. Uh, let's look at the wordy example. Uh, the reason we are recommending the computerization of this process is because it will reduce the time required to obtain data and will give us more accurate data. Yeah, that's just, just terrible. I mean, they repeated a word, data, data, that doesn't sound good. Uh, computerization, I mean, what, what the heck is that? That's this sounds terrible. A computer is a noun, <laughs> I would say. Why well, try to verbify it? Uh, let's look at their fix. Uh, tighter. Uh, computerizing the process will give us more accurate data more quickly. Uh, so they, they still like, they still got computerize there as a verb. I would think I would try to find something better than computerize. Uh, but it's I, <laughs> I would say I like that better than computerization of this process is because uh, that's just a mess computerizing the process will give us more accurate data more quickly all right so yeah they got rid of that double data there to obtain data and will give us more accurate data uh, they use this to get they basically have the same meaning 
but in just one sentence, two lines instead of to the four. All right, let's see, varying sentence length and structure. Uh, so edit sentences for tightness, we just covered that one. Uh, use short sentences when the subject matter is complicated. Uh, so I, if you're giving instructions, for example, and it's fairly uh, technical stuff, you might even just have one, you know, step one, maybe just three or four words. Step two, maybe just <laughs> push red button. <laughs> uh, step three, flip switch. Uh, you don't necessarily need, try to pack all that in a one big paragraph. It just could get really uh, confusing, unnecessarily confusing. Or if you're trying to define a word, uh, if you have a definition that goes on for four or five lines, that's probably not a really good definition. It's just going to make it more confusing. Uh, you want to make that definition short and sweet because it's, com it's complicated or you wouldn't be defining it, right? Uh, however, uh, the longer sentences are good too. Uh, they definitely show you how those ideas link to each other. We just saw that with that although on the previous couple slides ago. Uh, avoids the, the choppiness. So if you have all these short sentences back to back, it's, it's, people say that sounds choppy. It's hard to follow it. Uh, there doesn't seem to be connections between the ideas. It's like I'm going down a real bumpy highway, right? Uh, reducing the repetition. So we saw that back there with that data. They had data twice. You know, you could cut that out. Uh, grouping words into chunks, keeping the verbs uh, close to the subject. Uh, let's take a look at some examples. I think you need some examples to figure those last two out. Uh, so this one is uh, the parallel structure. Uh, so let's see what we can do with this. Uh, during the interview, job candidates will take a skills test. The supervisor will interview the prospective employee and a meeting with recently hired employees will be held. Uh, so this, this is lacking parallelism. And parallel just means if you studied geometry, you know, you got lines that uh, line up, uh, they don't cross, right? <laughs> that would be perpendicular. Well, that's pretty messy. That perpendicular, uh, these are just going together. And the idea is these will be different words, uh, but they'll all fit that same structure. Uh, so let's take a look here at their fix. During the interview, job candidates will take a skills test, interview with the supervisor, meet with recently hired workers. So this is parallel because you got each one of these items here, bullet points, starts with a verb, take, interview, meet, and then they follow that with the, the objects, right? So we'll take the test, interview with the supervisor, meet with the hired uh, workers. So hopefully you can hear that. I think the real key here is just looking at how each one of those starts with a verb, take, interview, meet, uh, whereas up here it's take, and then the next one is the supervisor, and then the third one is a meeting. So this is really not parallel. Uh, this is nicely parallel. It lines up nice. It fits the structure. All right, now we're talking about putting the readers into the sentences. So you might recall this from a couple lectures ago. Well, let's see, uh, this is their bad example. Uh, an election to name a beneficiary other than the participant's spouse must be made with spousal consent for any participant who is married. <laughs> I don't know what the heck I just read. Uh, let's look at the fix, or the uh, revision one, revised one. If you are married, you need your spouse's consent to name a beneficiary other than your spouse. All right. And so they say the you, they did use you. So, um, you know, some people, ah, oh, you can't use you. That's incorrect. Uh, whatever. <laughs> forget, forget you. <laughs> uh, we're going to use it because it makes it a lot easier to understand. Uh, it's, it's just a lot clearer. I, I don't even know what the heck they're saying up here in this first one. Uh, the second one, though, it's it's very clear what, what, it, what it means. Yes, they used you and your, but it makes sense to do that. All right, let's see. Ten ways to make your writing easy to read continued. <laughs> then we're just about done. <laughs> uh, so as you write revised paragraphs, uh, begin most of them with a topic sentence and use transitions to link the ideas. Uh, so you probably know what topic sentences and transitions are, but let's take a look. Because uh, I find this is really one of the most common problems in student writing is uh, a lack of these. 
Uh, so they're saying uh, begin most paragraphs with the topic sentence. In other words, what is the paragraph about? Uh, they say uh, it's unify. Uh, discusses or paragraphs uh, should have unity. <laughs> That's another bit of jargon there. If you just say something is, if you say you're talking about paragraph unity, uh, you're saying that you, you have a topic, you discuss it in one paragraph. Well, okay, now I want to go to another topic. Well, don't just keep putting it into that first paragraph. Uh, start hit. <laughs> hit enter, hit tab, start a new paragraph. There we go. Uh, so you don't have uh, everything in just one big messy paragraph. You talk about one thing, you talk about another thing in a different paragraph. I guess this is probably not the best, uh, <laughs> the best looking. There we go. Let's try this. So there you go. There's your first paragraph. And you want to switch to a different topic. You put it in this, the second paragraph and so on and so forth. So what is that topic sentence? It's just the first line in there that says, again, what, what is the point of that paragraph? What, what the heck is this about? Also should forecast paragraph structure. And this one, I, I don't know where students are getting this. I, I keep hearing students tell me that uh, their teachers told them they shouldn't do this, that uh, you shouldn't put sentences in your paragraph about, you know, first I'll talk about this, and second I'll talk about this. You know, I don't, I don't even know if that's true. I don't even think that's true for academic writing. Uh, you should always do. You don't necessarily need to put it in those exact words, uh, but you really should do what you can to forecast uh, the structure of that paragraph. You know, what order, what are you going to be talking about and in, in what order are you going to put it? Uh, it's really no, it's not an error. It's a good thing. And then uh, lastly, helping the readers to remember the points. So again, if I were had a uh, topic sentence that said, uh, there are three good reasons to use topic sentences. Okay, so that, that sentence there lets you know there's going to be three points. So you can be expecting those points, you know, sort of forecasted that. It'll also help you to remember them because I could say first, second, third, and then you can think back and put those in. It sort of helps when you have a list like that to, to remember that to remember it. <laughs> All right, there we go. Transitions uh, to link the ideas and transitions, another bit of jargon, right? It just means signals, uh, signals and connections between ideas. Uh, so when you have a sentence and a period and a sentence and a period, or you have uh, you know multiple paragraphs, uh, the idea is that when you get to the second sentence, it should be clear how it relates to what you were just talking about. So in that other that example I just gave you, where I said uh, there are three points. So the first point is blah, blah, blah. The second point, see when I say the second point here, uh, you can see how that relates. I'm saying, okay, we're going to stop talking about that. Now I'm going to tell you my second point, then my third point. Or it could just be that word like we had before with the although, or maybe uh, however. You know, when you say however, you're saying, I'm going to, Go a little different direction here. So really, the key. This is what I look for when I'm writing and editing. So if I got a sentence and another sentence, I look at the end of this and the beginning of this next sentence, and I, I just ask myself, can, can the reader figure out how I got from there to there, <laughs> or did I just jump on to a different topic? Or maybe it's clear in my head how those relate, but will it be clear to the reader? which is really always the key. Uh, so we can look at the, these examples here, say maybe saying an addition would help, or similarly, or for example would help. Or I like this uh, on the other hand. So you can say on the one hand, uh, transitions, blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, blah, blah, blah. So it's just a quick way to just say there's going to be two points there with the, it might sound like they uh, contradict each other. So hopefully this is making sense. All right, revising, editing, and proofreading, just some more <laughs> jargon for you, uh, but useful because uh, these are the processes that all writers engage in. So we, we talked about revision being content changes, organization, tone, sort of big picture stuff. So if you uh, you want to start with this, you write your rough draft, you look you look over it, you say, you know what, I need another paragraph. Or, man, I, I, this, is, this paragraph's in the wrong spot. Or... It, it sounds, the whole thing just sounds too informal. I need to make it more formal. 
Now, so those are big picture stuff. You want to do that first. But, uh, the second one is editing. Uh, so this is where you're satisfied basically with the layout. You're okay with it. It's fine. Uh, but you know there's probably a bunch of errors in there. There's a bunch of sentences that are might be awkward, confusing. Uh, you might want to work on your parallelism or transitions, all that, all that stuff we just talked about. Uh, so that's the next phase, the, the editing phase, looking for mechanical flaws, errors. And then the last step there is proofreading, which this is even like a little uh, final step. And a lot of people will skip this one, unfortunately. Uh, but it's really where you catch most of your errors. And so what I like to do, I always recommend this, is when you're done revising, you're done editing, try to let the document sit for a while. So this is why it's so useful to work ahead. So if you know the essay is due on Friday, if you do your rough draft and your revision and your editing and you have all that ready by, say, Thursday or, or even Wednesday, well, then you can just let it sit for a couple of days. And then that day that it's due, you can take it back out. and got a fresh pair of eyes on it. And you can really look and see, oh, you know, I, I got the wrong letter there. <laughs> or I used A-R-E, uh, R, where I meant to say O-U-R, our. That's a pretty common one. Uh, so you can find all that stuff. It's going to be really hard to see it, though, if you just keep working in one big, uh, one big session. You need a little break uh, before you go to the proofreading. All right, so we'll just wrap up here with some quick advice about these steps. Let's see if I can add to these, maybe. Uh, revised draft uh, three times or more. Uh, all right, I guess. Uh, you're looking for content, clarity, organization, layout, tone, and style. Uh, this would be excellent things to look look for. I would probably recommend if, if you write your rough draft and you want to write your second draft, probably the first thing would be to look at what they actually have here for two, right? Say, so do you have a uh, does it make sense the way you've laid this thing out? Then you might get into the content and figuring out. Uh, I think a good organization will help you spot the weaknesses. So maybe you have a, you wanted to talk about three topics, but somehow you've only got uh, one sentence about the one topic. You know, a good layout will help you spot that, and you can add more content uh, to that section. And then the tone and style, we, we've been talking about this. Not just clarity, but... Uh, the level of formality, for example, if you're using you and I, uh, that's informal. Doesn't mean incorrect, just means uh, it's informal. So is, is that appropriate? If it is, fine. If it's not, you'll want to go in there and, and take that out. Now, read the document from start to finish. I would stress here, read it out loud. If you read aloud, you're going to catch so much stuff. It's just really, really vital to do that. Uh, if it's if it's even remotely important, just take a second, read it out loud. You'll definitely catch things. Uh, that, and don't read like a read the document from start. To, uh, don't do that. You say read the document from start to finish. You know, read it in a kind of a professional tone. And if there's a missing word, or if it's the wrong word, or it's got the wrong punctuation, anything like that will probably leap out, and you could fix it. And then let's see the last piece there. Do light revision when time is short. <laughs> Yeah, so even if you got to send this email today, it certainly doesn't hurt. Just even if you just get up and stand up for a couple, uh, maybe just a second or two, right? Just take your eyes off it, just a little time, uh, take a little break, and then come back, and maybe even that'll help. All right, and then the editing. And remember, this is where we're getting into the a little bit more of a fine edit. Uh, revision was big picture stuff, right? Editing little picture getting down to the sentence level, paragraph level. Uh, just some tips. Uh, they talk about hard copies, not screens. So what, what happens a lot of times, and I can vouch for this, uh, something about editing editing on the screen is you miss things. It's just, I don't know, it's some kind of psychological thing. Uh, but if you print it out and you're looking at it on paper, uh, you'll see errors that you probably wouldn't see on the screen. And again, I don't know why this is. Uh, all I can tell you is that it's true. So if it's really important, and especially if you're going to go print 100 of these things, <laughs> it's just so dumb. <laughs> I see it all the time. Uh, somebody will be making a, a poster or a newsletter or even wedding invitations, 
and they'll uh, say, I want, you know, I'm going to need 100 copies or five, maybe even 1,000 copies of this. And they've just edited it, edited it, edited it on the screen so they don't see that they've made some errors. And then as soon as they get those uh, printouts, as soon as they get the hard copies, they look down and, oh, my God. You know, I've made a horrendous, embarrassing mistake. Why didn't I see it on the screen? And now I'm stuck here. I've, I paid all this money for all these copies and I'll have to either send these out and be humiliated or I'll have to do the whole thing again. So really what, what should have happened there, the person should have, you know, you know what? I think I'll just go ahead and print out one of these invitations just here on my home printer. You know, just, just to look it over again. Uh, maybe get a friend to look at it. You know, just, just kind of take that little extra step uh, before I send it down to the printer's office and have uh, 5,000 copies made. Uh, let's see what else. Check errors you often make. And you, yeah, this is the stuff you'll just have to know for yourself. So if teachers have often said, you, you, you know, you got comma problems or you've got a lot of sentence fragments, well, you know, that's your weakness. Uh, you need to figure out uh, how to find those and fix those. Uh, sentence structures, agreements, punctuations. Uh, I think one of the ones that we all struggle with is uh, it's, uh, so I-T-S like that, or I-T apostrophe S. This gives people lots of trouble. And it's not really that hard. The rule is just, that, you know, the one with the apostrophe is it is, or it has, and you just pop it into the sentence and see which, which one you're talking about. But, you know, it's one thing to know the rule, uh, when you're in the heat of writing, you'll just not even be thinking about it. So what, it's, it's fine. It just means that when you're editing, you want to be looking out for that. You know, is that one that needs an apostrophe or not? You can even just do a quick search or find all your its <laughs> and you know, look for it that way. And I think I mentioned the uh, R-A-R-E uh, versus the O-U-R. You know, that's another one that trips a lot of people up, uh, me included. So it's just useful as you're going back over it to just, you know, look at those, sort of know where your weaknesses are and pay attention to that. All right, last uh, slide. So when you proofread, uh, check with the spell checker and by eye. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of times uh, it might underline a word and say it's misspelled and really it's not. Uh, but the other problem is sometimes it won't, no, it's like sometimes that it's and it's will slip through. Uh, or if you put O-U-R instead of uh, A-R-E, yeah, that's spelled right. And it's not like you misspelled the word. It's just not the right word. Uh, so that's a good trick. Uh, swap the copy with the proofing buddy. Uh, that would be invaluable if you have a friend that's, <laughs> if you have a friend willing to do that, it's great. Uh, read once quickly for meaning and then read again slowly. That's pretty good advice. So just see, does it make sense? And then you can get down into this uh, wordiness issues, or passive voice and, and errors. Uh, so correct the errors and reread the entire line. Uh, this one here is just such a, a problem. Uh, so I've worked with a lot of professional proofreaders. I'll be proofreading my work and they'll find an error somewhere and they'll fix that error but it actually makes it makes the sentence wrong at that point. So you can't just fix, sometimes you can't just fix one little word. Uh, you know, if, it doesn't matter if you correct the spelling of a word, uh, if that wasn't the right word to begin with. So you need to make, if you fix it, fine, but then go back, look at the whole sentence again, make sure that it makes sense. Because sometimes you'll actually introduce more errors when you're proofreading than were there. <laughs> it's happened to me. <laughs> Uh, just, but it's easily fixed. Uh, just re if you fix one little thing, go back and read the whole thing over again. Make sure it's, it fits. All right. So reading backwards, reading pages out of order. Uh, this is more of a problem if you've been working on something for so long. You, you just kind of get uh, so used to seeing it, you don't even really notice. It. So you, you might have a problem, but you're not seeing it. Kind of, uh, it's invisible to you. So there's some tricks. Start with the start at the last page, work your way back. You know, sometimes that can kind of break you out of that flow. Uh, you could even just look at parts of sentences instead of reading it start to finish. Uh, and that, that this definitely helps too. All right, so we've covered quite a bit here. Uh, if you do have questions, comments, um, suggestions, <laughs> whatever it is, I'd love to hear them. Uh, but for now, have a great day and see you next time.